Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here today. I have a real passion at looking at how we can design machines, not just from my love of working with machines and technology, but also at looking at designing them for humans. Often when we talk about designing machines, we think of the, the fun video game, the recreational things that we use, the smartphones, or, or neat robots that we use for isolated tasks. But what I have a real passion for now is looking at how we design machines for complex operations, for safety critical situations, for, for what I'll call the work of experts. And indeed, the work of experts. Let me start there. Work is different from, uh, from what we commonly call play or recreation in that it has some purpose. It has some gold standard, some target that we would like to have happen. And this is work that happens in an environment that is dynamic, changing, and uncertain. An expert is a person who understands this operating environment in which they're working, knows how to work on the environment, knows how to respond to the little things that come up in the environment, knows where the constraints are, what they can and can't do, understands the fundamental dynamics, and from that, an expert can find the clear and consistent path from where they are to what they would like to achieve. Now, within this then, let's look, for example, at landing an airplane at Lisbon. In this case, we have an aircraft that has inherent flight dynamics that tightly constrain where it can fly safely, and even more tightly constrain the most fuel efficient uh, flight path, one that looks at noise and environmental concerns. And we have multiple experts. On the flight deck, we will have a, a captain and a first officer. Here's a picture of Lisbon Air Traffic Control Center. And these experts working together have a, an understanding that comes not just from training, but years of experience. This understanding of the whole operating environment includes the aircraft, all the air traffic operations and procedures, and together they can see a clear path by which they can take this aircraft down for landing. This air expertise has some deep uh, meaning to us. If we look at a pilot looking at a cockpit, each of these instruments have instant meaning, and the their expertise is reflected not just in understanding what they mean, but in how they pattern even the movement of their eyes. The most important aspect, if you look at the work of a pilot, is in controlling the airplane, the pitch up and down, and the roll side to side, and that is shown right in the center in the artificial horizon display that shows the sky is blue, the ground below is black, and the airplane as a little red moving symbol that can move. The attitude of the airplane can change so rapidly that you have to look at this all the time as a pilot. The pilot understands this. If they want to check their heading, they glance down, but what's interesting is they come back up. If they want to look at their airspeed, they glance left, but then they come back. For their altitude, they look right, and then they come back. And this expertise then is reflected not just by looking out at the cockpit in a general sense, not by scanning it at random or in some circular pattern, but by directing their attention in very specific ways that recognize they know how things can vary. I use the word automatic, I mean that formally, but it's also something that can be varied with the task. When climbing, the pilot knows to look also at the vertical speed indicator. When turning, the pilot will also reference the turn coordinator. And so this information, how you interact and gather information from the environment is something that is deeply embedded. Now we can use this when we design. For example, if we want to take all the primary flight information and put it on a computer display, we can do that. We do do that. But note, the artificial horizon, it's still in the center. The airspeed, it's still on the left. Now is a vertical tape. The altitude is on the right, the vertical speed to the right, the heading below. We build on the pilot's expertise and the training and, and years of experience that they have. Now, I personally am a pilot and uh, have worked mostly on the flight deck, but this notion of expertise is not limited to the flight deck. A teacher looks out and understands that a classroom has a dynamic, 
that it can have bad dynamics that can be managed, it can be managed towards good dynamics. And indeed, a good teacher has a purpose that they want to achieve with every student and, and ha develops over the years deep experience and understanding of how to manage this complex environment. And likewise, a good chef may not be able to represent chemistry and physics, thermodynamics, acid-base reactions, and differential equations. But a good chef has a deep intuition of all of these physical actions, of all of the tools and mechanisms that are available to him in his environment, and can use that to plan again a dish that he would like to prepare. So with this then, we have experts who work in the environment using and adapting tools, changing what is happening to create what they would like to have happen. But now we have an interesting time as we move to automation. Automation being the automatic operation of something that humans have done. This means that automation is now getting to the point a machine that can provide observation, decision, effort. We can no longer just model the physical flight dynamics. We are also modeling what the human does in terms of decisions, in terms of processing information, and in terms of planning. Now, the definition of automation here is a moving target. I've heard generations ago that it might be the child's duty to toast the bread over the kitchen stove. That was a job of the human, and when you uh, made a machine do it, you might call that automation. Since it was never my job, I won't use that definition. These days, we are looking more further forward. We're looking at things that drive themselves, fly themselves, operate themselves. And in so, they have such incredible capability that we say they have agency, the ability to go and form their own interactions, their own dynamic with the environment. Even so, they don't work alone. Take, for example, again, the flight deck. Here we have a pilot with a chart, and this pilot has just been given a command by air traffic control. Uh, starts with her call sign, Golf Tango 123, heading 050 to intercept Framingham Radial 210 inbound. Then J64 is filed, cross Framingham at 18,000 feet. Wow, okay. This does mean something to the pilot. Uh, they know what this phraseology is, and looking at their chart, they can see that there's a navigation aid, uh, the hexagonal symbol named Framingham, that they're given directions about how they will fly towards it, and then how they will fly outbound on Jet Route 64. And the pilot, just flying his or herself, would know instantly how to do this. It might be tiring to be sitting there moving the controls, but they would know how to do it. In an air transport cockpit, on the other hand, now the pilot's job is not only knowing how to fly the airplane themselves. The pilot's job may be, how do I get the automation to do this? Up top is the mode control panel that's mounted at the top of the dash. And the heading is pretty easy. We could dial in 050 on the heading knob there. But the other aspects of this air traffic control command involve programming the control display unit shown below. Where do you start? None of those buttons map anything that the controller has just said. The auto flight system has its own way of flying that doesn't map neatly and nicely to the fundamental work of the pilot. And so an additional aspect that we find we're training pilots on is trying to train the pilots on how to use this. Likewise, I've served in the past as a director of a large aviation safety program, and our concerns these days are no longer with the pilot themselves making a manual control error. Our concerns these days are with the pilot not knowing what the automation is doing or how to program it correctly. And errors here have ranged from the, the comedic programming in the wrong airport to land at to the tragic programming the airport to fly th uh, the airplane to fly through a mountain. So here then, what we find is that we are putting automation into these complex environments as a separate thing. We can show that the automation has a path that will make the trajectory, that will end up at the, the, the point we'd like to land at, but it's not the way that often the human expert would have themselves chosen. 
And this requires two things of the human expert. One is they have to make their own conceptual model of how the system works. They may have been an expert pilot, an expert chef, an expert teacher, but now we have to ask them to go study the automation. And likewise, this requires them to look at a new way of doing the work, to change their fundamental work practices. Both of these things can be formidable. Indeed, let's think about it. Let's think of our own personal experience. We are all experts at something. Which is harder? Learning how a system works. This depends on the system, I suppose, but it also depends on you. It depends on whether this system mirrors something you know how to do. One of the beauties of many nice designs is you can pick up something, a smartphone, that's a very sophisticated piece of technology, but because you know what you want to do with it, you know which button to press. And so learning how to use a complicated system may not be hard. You might look at it and say, this is what I've been needing to make my work easier. On the other hand, have you ever dealt with a system that has made your work harder, that has made you work in different ways? Here we can point to bad designs. I'll think of some websites just for ordering things for shopping where I know what I want to do. I just can't get there. It makes me go through 10 extra steps that don't make any sense. What is up with that? Why does it use that process? Trying to figure out why this system works in a different way than your own expertise is often the harder thing. And the bigger disruption to a, 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 an operational environment or a work environment comes in when you try to change their work practices. So with this then, if we're looking at effective machine support for the experts, I'd propose that instead of focusing on the pink box, the automation, we should focus on the expertise. How does an expert plan their work? And then we should figure out how to imbue that intelligence into the machine. Have the machine do the work, benefit from the expertise of the expert. With this, the conceptual model of the system is trivial. It makes sense. The system does what you would want to do the work, and it helps you do the work. Its benefit here is clear. It's helping you with a work practice that you understand. Now, this all sounds well and good, although I've already given examples where it's not happening. We can also point to where we hope to use automation to extend our capabilities. Here in Europe, this is our program, is wanting to develop a new air traffic system that uses new concepts of operation, new practices for more efficient air traffic control. And in that case, we can look at, well, if you, can, if you want to change the work practice, think about it cogently. Think about how much you want to disrupt it, rather than picking an arbitrary path an arbitrary process, pick something that builds as much as possible on what you've done before. Here, I've tried to represent this notionally as pick a pink line that stays within the work practices for as much as possible. View the automation then as something that only goes outside of the work, only changes the work incrementally, and builds on the expertise of your expert. With it then, recognize that you are going to need to train the expert on these new work practices, and the conceptual model, the automation, is stretching them in a new direction. Now, I'm so hopeful of how we can do this. I look at the left here, at the current day uh, generation of computer interfaces, at the air traffic control command that we would like to implement with them, but I can also point to new interfaces that we are testing out, such as this interface here from Chris Mysiak, Vic Riley, and others at Honeywell developed a few years ago. Obviously, the interface on the right is more pretty. It has a better aesthetic. It's got a, a nice moving map display with color, but that, the, the surface aesthetic is not what makes it so beautiful to me. What makes this so beautiful to me is that now the command structure, the way it does its work, the functions you can ask it to do directly map to what the pilot wants. So if the pilot wants the airplane to hold a heading of 050, click on H, click on 050. If you want to cross Framingham at 18,000 feet, click on C, 
it knows that right now crossing might be something you would want to do and cross at 18,000 feet. And this means that they had to restructure all the logic, all the functioning of the system in behind it so that the automation would work the way that the pilot wanted it. Again, it's not just a pilot. Let's also look at the classroom. Here's some photos I've taken from the Khan Academy. Putting a, computers in children's classrooms can be incredibly disruptive. Just putting a, class, a computer in front of each student doesn't guarantee learning. Instead, the work practice of the teacher, of giving the students lessons, confirming their comprehension, intervening wherever any student has problems, is the ongoing work practice before computers and now with computers. Each lesson here is a column, each student is a row, and with one glance at the teacher's computer, the teacher can assess which students are, are in the yellow or orange, having trouble with a, mastering a concept, and can go to them immediately. And this is a case where we can look at these new technologies as helping dramatically. Instead of all the students doing the same assessment at the same time, the teacher taking it home, grading it, a couple days later realizing that a couple days before a particular student had had a problem, now the teacher gets that instantaneous feedback that allows us to do the same work practice, but using technology to do it better. And so I'm excited about the future, but I think that it has some challenges for us in the engineering community. To date, we focused on understanding the technology but now, engineers need to understand human experts, what the work is that they do, how they conceive of it. And this is going to be hard. We can look at studies of decision making right now where they're finding that human intuition, expert decision makers are doing a better job than any computerized decision logic could have ever predicted, based on intuition, based on their expertise. And decision-making is just one aspect of expert behavior in complex environments. So somehow engineers need to find some engineering approach to understanding the expert's work. And then we need to translate it. Translate it into the performance standards, the requirements, and the functions that we would like this automation to do. We should think of automation not in terms of machines' performance, but in terms of how well they manifest the work that the experts would like to see. And this is a new perspective on design, a perspective that looks at supporting the human expert. Thank you.